Hey everybody, I'm Cheryl Fox, the Carb Addiction RD. My plan today was to put together a quick little video on carnivore teeth. You know how they feel so slippery and smooth when you don't eat sugar, kind of like you just came back from having a tooth cleaning at the dentist? Well, anyway, I started doing a little research and it turns out it's a much bigger story than I anticipated. So I thought I would share it all with you and I hope you find this whole story as interesting as I do. Now you've probably heard the expression that the eyes are the window to the soul. I'd like to propose a different spin on that and suggest that the teeth are the window to your metabolic health. Nearly half of all adults have some form of periodontal disease, which can progress to tooth loss, impacting the ability to chew the food. So just like other chronic diseases, incidence increases with age and some 70% of adults over the age of 65 have it and there is an association between periodontal disease and diabetes, in inducing an increased cardiovascular disease risk. So if you don't have carnivore teeth, you may want to pay attention. Let's start with a little history. Prior to the development of agricultural societies, tooth decay was not a common issue. The arrival of farming introduced an increase in carbohydrate intake, which directly correlated with an increase in the incidence of tooth decay. Aristotle correctly attributed dental caries to sweet foods like figs. However, a lingering theory for the cause of dental decay was something called toothworms were eating the roots of the teeth. Claudius Gallen in the second century discovered that teeth were comprised of bones with nerves inside rather than worms. Then Pierre Fauchard, who lived from 1678 to 1761 and known as the father of modern dentistry, disproved the toothworm theory with observations under the microscope, and he proposed that the true cause was sugar, suggesting that consumption should be limited. However, since then, sugar intake greatly has increased, along with the rapid increase in the prevalence of dental caries into the 19th century. This diagram shows us the anatomy of a tooth. Something most people don't recognize, however, is that tooth decay also occurs from the inside out. Here you can see that there are blood vessels that deliver nutrients to the interior of the tooth. If a person has poor blood glucose control, this will affect the tooth just as it does the other organs. On the outside, the visible part of the tooth is the enamel. This is the hardest substance found in the human body and is mostly made up of the mineral hydroxyapatite. The CDC states that tooth decay is caused by certain bacteria in the mouth. When a person eats sugar and other refined carbohydrates, these bacteria produce acids that remove minerals from the surface of the tooth. Here is what hydroxyapatite looks like. It's a complex structure filled with lots of calcium ions, phosphate groups, and hydroxyl groups. The mouth is normally neutral with a pH between 6.7 and 7.4, but the acid produced by oral bacteria as they break down dietary sugars creates an environment with a pH below 5.5. When this occurs, the outer hydroxyapatite minerals of the tooth dissolve. Once the pH rises again, the tooth will remineralize, that is, the hydroxyapatite will reform. But of course, the tooth was more vulnerable to decay during the period of lower pH. And this is where fluoride comes in. Fluorine will bind to the calcium and the phosphate, essentially replacing the hydroxyl groups to produce fluoroapatite as the enamel rebuilds. Fluoroapatite-based enamel is more resistant to demineralization under acidic conditions, so this is the rationale for using fluoride in the water, toothpaste, etc. Let me quote the CDC website again. Fluoride helps to rebuild and strengthen the tooth's surface. Water fluoridation prevents tooth decay by providing frequent and consistent contact with low levels of fluoride. By keeping the tooth strong and solid, fluoride stops cavities from forming and can even rebuild the tooth's surface. It's interesting to note, however, that researchers in the 1940s emphasized that in addition to this hardened enamel, fluoride also worked by attacking the bacteria's enzymes, essentially poisoning them. Nevertheless, fluoridation of public drinking water was suggested as a means to decrease dental decay. Again, from the CDC website, in the 1930s, scientists discovered that children who drank water with naturally high levels of fluoride had less tooth decay. 
This was considered important because during that time, most Americans were affected by tooth decay. One of the earliest water fluoridation trials in Grand Rapids, Michigan, claimed to find little to no cavities among the children and over 10 years, a reduction of 63.3% in dental caries compared to a nearby town without fluoridation. Their conclusion was that the amount used is safe and absolutely harmless. Despite how definitive this sounds, there's much controversy today about how reliable this study was, but nonetheless, it was the foundation of the push to fluoridate tap water in the United States. Meanwhile, the propaganda machine started to whirl. The influential pro-fluoride citizens committee, called the Committee to Protect Our Children's Teeth, published a booklet called Our Children's Teeth. It was filled with reassurances of fluoride's safety, and denunciations of critics. It was led by the famous pediatrician, Dr. Benjamin Spock, and was funded by none other than the Kellogg Foundation. The American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics, among other groups, quickly fell in line. All right, let's back up a bit. What exactly is fluoride? Fluorine is an element found in nature. It is represented by the letter F in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table shown here. It is extremely small, making it very permeable. It possesses the highest electron negativity value of all elements, meaning it is highly reactive. The element fluorine is not found in nature. Due to its reactivity, it is always associated with other elements. For example, hard water contains calcium fluoride. Even though fluoride compounds were identified in the middle 1500s and were used to etch glass as early as 1670, It wasn't until work by chemists in the 1800s that its reactivity and toxicity were scientifically documented. The Frenchman Henri Moisson finally succeeded in isolating fluorine, which earned him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1906. However, less than one year later, on his deathbed at the age of 54, he blamed his illness on fluorine toxicity. Around the time of the Great Rapids study, fluoride had become a major industrial waste. Due to its extreme toxicity, industrial accidents and worker exposures were creating headaches for major corporations. In his book, The Case Against Fluoride, Chris Bryson proposed that fluoridation was a way of changing the image of fluoride from one of the worst air pollutants responsible for many lawsuits from farmers and others claiming damage to something safe enough to give children in their drinking water. Well, fluoridation of the water supply was and remains controversial, but here in the United States, it was heavily endorsed. So when I was researching this topic, I did what I always do, which is to reach for the dietary reference intakes by the Institute of Medicine. Well, I found the recommendations for adult females to be three milligrams per day and for adult males to be four milligrams per day. And the upper limit per day is 10 milligrams. And yet, there are no known biochemical pathways or enzymatic processes in the body that require fluoride. That's weird, I thought. So out of curiosity, I checked to see if other questionable nutrients were included. I looked up aluminum, arsenic, lead, even plutonium. You won't be surprised to learn that there's no recommended intake of any of those elements. But fluoride? Hmm. And how exactly did the authors arrive at their recommendations? The amount chosen was an intake that would supposedly prevent dental caries, and the safe maximum was determined as the amount that avoided the early signs of skeletal fluorosis. You can look, guys, but I couldn't find any titration studies to establish these doses. It is well recognized that ingesting too much fluoride during the ages when teeth are developing can lead to dental fluorosis, which is a dental mottling consisting of softened and porous enamel that is poorly mineralized. As a result of industrial accidents and poor work conditions in industry during the early to mid 19th century, we have learned that excess fluoride can actually cause abnormal bone growth. 
The deformities can occur in any bone, but when this happens in the spinal column, the spinal discs can grow so large they actually fuse, resulting in a crippling and painful disability called skeletal fluorosis. While skeletal fluorosis is the result of a high intake of fluoride, it's difficult to establish what a truly safe intake might be. Regulatory bodies have operated since the very beginning on the premise that one milligram per liter in the water is safe and effective. But even at this dose, up to 41% of 12 to 15 year olds suffer from some degree of dental fluorosis. So the question goes begging, if the teeth are showing signs of distress, could there be other effects that we don't see? Indeed, there's a very long list of possible negative health outcomes from fluoridation, depending on the source even more than on this list. While association does not equal causation, questions are being asked, and if it has been put into our water, concern seems legitimate. Some afflictions could well be the result of other toxins getting a better foothold as a result of fluoride. For instance, industrial waste fluoride likely contains arsenic and lead, potent toxins in their own right. Aluminum tends to co-accumulate with fluoride, and they act synergistically. Silicofluorides, fluosilicic acid and sodium fluosilicate, are used in over 90% of U.S. fluoridated municipal water supplies. Those aren't the same as the calcium fluoride, which occurs naturally in hard water, and they're also different than the hydrogen fluoride used in, for testing in most labs. Chemistry's kind of cool that way. Different combinations of elements have very different effects and silico fluoride will corrode brass plumbing, causing increased levels of lead in the drinking water. Also, poor nutrition has been correlated with increased vulnerability to the effects of fluoride, thus aggravating the exposure of the inner city poor. Of particular note is the relationship between fluoride and hypothyroidism. This is of great concern to me due to the ra rapidly increasing rates of hypothyroidism in the U.S. today. Fluorine is a bully. It pushes others out of the way and takes their place. If fluorine replaces the iodine in your T4, your thyroid hormones simply can't work as expected. But hypothyroidism testing won't detect the replacement of iodine with that fluorine ion. In the 1930s, an Austrian physician named Gorlitzer von Mundi treated over 600 hyperthyroid patients successfully with fluoride baths reasoning that the fluoride would compete with the action of iodine on the thyroid gland and thereby decrease the hyperactivity. He also warned that fluoride exposure in normal individuals would lead to a hypothyroid condition. In addition, researchers now are confirming what the early fluoride scientists knew, that fluoride is an enzyme poison. It inhibits glycolysis and other enzyme reactions by binding in the place of the required cofactors, much as it takes the place of hydroxyl atoms in the hydroxyapatite on our teeth. I mentioned the Kellogg Foundation earlier, but there's more to the story. In 1949, the Sugar Research Foundation, representing 130 sugar interests, decided that it needed to find a way to reduce dental caries without reducing sugar consumption. Fluoride, delivered through the water, quickly became the way to achieve that goal, and considerable sums of money were paid to prominent fluoride researchers at leading American universities. One researcher who gave the sugar lobby what it wanted was Dr. Frederick Stair, founder of the Harvard University Department of Nutrition. Now guys, I'm a tough girl. So there's always naturally going to be competition between Tufts and Harvard, but he was one bad dude when it comes to sugar. Check it out. Even on his Wikipedia page, it gives you a hint. During a nearly six-decade career, Dr. Stair attacked health food advocates as charlatans on national TV and in his syndicated newspaper column and was a lead advocate for water fluoridation. He even managed to convince the Food and Nutrition Board to list fluoride as essential in 1958. And that, of course, is why I found dietary recommendations for fluoride in my DRI reference book. Here are some quotes attributed to Dr. Stair. There is no convincing evidence that in the average American diet, decreasing the intake of sweets will lessen tooth decay. 
Ice cream, potato chips, cookies, and soft drinks are nutritious snacks. Coke is a good after-school teenage snack. He called opponents of fluoridation compulsive critics characterized as neurotics driven by mystic, primitive, subconscious fears. And finally, he said fluoride deficiency, the lack of fluoride, is probably the most prevalent nutritional deficiency in the country. So let's think about this for a minute. We can all agree that sugar causes tooth decay and more serious diseases like periodontal disease, which is linked to chronic illnesses like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's possible that drinking fluoridated water or brushing your teeth with fluoride toothpaste will help prevent that decay. But consider this, if you stop eating sugar, wouldn't that solve the problem? You know, without any of the possible harm, well, I don't want to leave you hanging. There are some steps that you can take to reduce your exposure to fluoride. First, find out if you're even drinking fluoridated water. Town and state websites have this information available. You can always opt for bottled water, or you can do what we do in my family, which is to use a reverse osmosis filtration system. Then we remineralize with non-fluoridated salt. Yes, there are places that put fluoride in their salt, Looking at you, Geneva, where I was born. Yeah, so you can also choose toothpaste without fluoride. One that I particularly like is Boca. Can you see that? Guess what its main ingredient is? Hydroxyapatite. So when you brush your teeth with it and don't rinse it off, it stays on your teeth and actually rebuilds and remineralizes your tooth enamel using the mineral that is already naturally there. Finally, if you do have some soft spots on your teeth, you know, areas that your dentist is monitoring to see if it needs to be filled, I highly recommend chewing xylitol flavored gum. If you've never heard of it, it's pretty cool. There's actually research showing reversal of tooth decay from using chewing xylitol flavored gum. And guys, this has been my experience too. Different brands include Pure, and I, we have Epic right now. Um, there are probably some others too. I'm not recommending brands, but try it because at least we always know that there's no sugar, right? So you're not doing that harm, and yet you're also helping your tooth to heal with the xylitol, so it's pretty cool. Um, so without sugar in your diet, there's really nothing for bacteria to feed on, so no plaque develops, and therefore there's really no need for fluoride. So let's all get carnivore teeth and put those dentists out of business and ensure our overall metabolic health. I've included an extensive list, list of references for you. Um, you know, that big pile that I showed you at the beginning. Um, should you want to look into it all a little bit more, uh, there are also some books that I read that you might be interested in. Um, anyways, it's always up to you. I urge you to do your own research before you make any decisions. Uh, but most of all, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening.